Fuck. Okay. Well, let's get started. Um, so thanks everybody for joining us this morning on another edition of the Soho Summit, a live uh, kind of webinar series. Uh, if you have attended some of the previous sessions, you'll know that we were doing uh, webinars on various topics. We've had everything from uh, Mark, one of our panelists today, did the, uh, the pandemic, pandemic pivot a few weeks ago. Uh, Chris Whiteley, another panelist today, uh, did a session on uh, Facebook advertising and how to uh, get 688% plus ROI. Um, uh, we've had Roger Darby and a few others, but it's been kind of webinar style. So we decided to change it up this week and do a, a panel discussion um, or a panel kind of Q&A. So when you registered, you submitted some questions and we've got those all listed up for our, our panelists today. We've got some great questions. Uh, but if you have any follow-up questions or anything else you want to ask, just use the chat feature, which is down uh, on, on the bottom there. Click on that. You can uh, post a question in the chat. And uh, so a few housekeeping notes. First of all, I want to thank our sponsors. So we've got on the call with us uh, the folks from the West Shore Chamber of Commerce. They've been a great supporter uh, through the whole um, series of webinars that we've been doing. So if you're uh, interested, in, if you've got a business and you want to get more involved in the community, uh, they're a great group to join. Uh, Westshore.bc.ca, I believe. Uh, Sarah, maybe you can pop that in the chat. Um, and they're doing lots of uh, wonderful virtual sessions on uh, Zoom as well. So lots of good stuff there. Uh, other sponsor is Sirius Coffee, who I mentioned and I'm uh, partaking in uh, my stone ground chai latte. Mark, did you want to plug your sponsor? Yeah, I'm happy to be here on behalf of uh, Lysol Sanitary Wipes here. Yeah, the edible Kidding. version. <laughs> I should bring a new sponsor every time. Uh, so just wanted to say for uh, Serious Coffee, they're the, uh, the Millstream uh, Village um, location uh, over just across from kind of Home Depot and Costco uh, over in uh, Langford here. They're open from 7.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. every day. So go on over and uh, say hi to Paul and, and grab a beverage. Uh, what else? So coming up uh, next week, so we do this every Thursday at 11, free webinars. Next week, we've got Isabel Mercy Turcott, who some of you may recognize. She was a keynote speaker at Soho. Uh, and then the week after that, we've got Hugh Culver, who was the keynote speaker at last year's Soho Summit in October. Uh, and so a couple of great speakers there uh, and uh, information about their session is on the Soho website. So if you go to SohoSummit.com, more information about that. Uh, also, if you stick around till the end of this session today, uh, we've got something a little different. Uh, we've decided to do a draw for a prize and one lucky member of the, uh, or one lucky attendee today is going to get a, um, a one hour kind of brainstorming session with the four of us. So with the four panelists today, um, the winner, we will send you a needs assessment document, get your information back in terms of your business, what you uh, are looking for, and then we'll line up a one hour call on Zoom like this, but just one-on-one. -on -one, so you and the four of us, and we will ap apply the combined marketing expertise and brain power of the four of us uh, as much as that is to your business challenge or, or whatever questions you have to try to get you to the next level or get you started depending on who you are. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, we're gonna do a random draw at the, the end of today's session. So hang around for that. Uh, what else? So we're live on Facebook and I mentioned, yeah, uh, use the chat function for any questions. So let me just see what's coming in there. A couple of things. Awesome. And then I saw Sarah, you put in uh, some info about uh, the chamber. So that's excellent. All right. So let's get started. Uh, before we dive into the questions, uh, let's just do a quick little uh, round robin there and uh, I'm gonna have the panelists introduce themselves. So uh, let's go ladies before gentlemen. Uh, Catherine, you wanna uh, introduce yourself? Yes, hi, I'm Catherine Hamilton and I'm very pleased to be here today. So uh, thank you to uh, Chris and the group and everyone who's attending. Um, my focus is on an ideas catalyst and I help make uh, good marketing plans great. And I've been a marketer for about 25 years and I have a passion for content, um, which has been 
exciting now because there's a boom in creativity um, that we've been seeing as a result of COVID-19. So we've been leaning uh, pretty hard into that. Awesome. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, and Mr. Stoiber, over to you. Hey, I'm Mark Stoiber. I'm a brand strategist. And uh, yeah, I'm super stoked to be working with Chris and Chris again. And uh, yeah, looking forward to lots of questions. Awesome. Thank you. And last but not least, Mr. Whiteley. Hey, kids. I'm Chris Whiteley. I'm the Web Swiss Army Knife at uh, B West Interactive. So my job is basically to try to figure out um, how to fulfill the needs of uh, all of our clients. Uh, a lot of times people come to us with some really interesting technical challenges and it's my job to kind of go out and reverse engineer kind of what's happened through other campaigns and try to replicate that success for our clients. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of challenge and uh, I look forward to chatting with everybody today. Awesome. And you're the only one of the four of us with a whiteboard behind you. So you look my best friend. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's dig into the first, uh, first question. So we've got a bunch and I've kind of categorized them based on the different people that we have on the panel and the expertise, but there was a few that came in for all of us. And so the first one uh, is to all panelists and it's a general question, but it, it uh, of course relates to uh, what's happening in the, in the times that we find ourselves in now. And so that question is, can the panel share the collective view on the new trends and marketing in the post COVID world? So. We're not, uh, I wouldn't say we're in the post COVID world yet. Uh, uh, I guess we're in kind of phase two, uh, according to or the beginning of phase two, according to um, what Premier jo John Horgan announced yesterday uh, with the uh, loosening of the uh, uh, restrictions, I guess, on, on what we can do and some businesses are, are opening up. So if, if anyone saw that, it was kind of interesting to see what's happening, but uh, I assume this question is kind of more around what we're doing for our business and our, and our clients and, and helping them uh, and looking at how things are going to change. So I know uh, we've all talked about this uh, at various uh, degrees already. So uh, Mark, do you want to get us started on that one? Um, I hate the word pivot and uh, I use it all the time. Um, yeah. However, I heard something great from Ian Chisholm, who is uh, a smart, smart dude, um, works with executives, uh, coaches them. And he had a story in Douglas Magazine here in Victoria, and I'll throw it up on chat when I'm not speaking um, so folks can read it. And what he wrote was uh, that it's high time for us to zealously reassess everything that we do. And I thought that was brilliant advice, not to pivot because you don't know what you're going to pivot to, but everybody knows the old 80, 20 rule where 80% of what we do only generates 20% of the income and flip that around. Uh, but to reassess exactly what is making us money, what we have the most fun at and what people seem to respect us for. And I think this time, um, uh, has given us a little bit of moment to pause and reflect and watch just crazy stuff happen and make us go, is what I'm doing 80% of the time making me happy? So, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it's a very, a very, very good time to be zealously reassessing. And I'd say that's the, the number one trend that I'm seeing. Uh, definitely, I, I would agree. And I would say that uh, we're, we're all <clears throat> seeing and doing that. Uh, I know we certainly have been reassessing lots of things. Uh, and spending more time on those things that um, uh, are, are more valuable and of value to our clients and, and certainly anything online. So our business lends itself to, to what's happening. And mm -hmm. we quickly, I guess, pivoted from doing live Soho Summit speaker series sessions to um, webinars uh, like this. So that was kind of an easy pivot for us. But I definitely see that happening more in the future. And in fact, part of the... Um, uh, the, the, I don't know how many point plan that uh, John Horgan announced yesterday. One of them was that there would be no um, conventions or sporting events, I think. I don't know if you mentioned sporting events, but no conventions or rock concerts uh, this year. So no live events with, with large numbers of people. So of course, Soho Summit uh, was one of those uh, conventions. So we will do a, a, an online summit um, so that's kind of an easy uh, marketing pivot, but uh, yeah, let's get some other perspectives. Uh, Catherine, what, uh, what are you thinking and what are you seeing? 
Well, what I'm thinking is, as you said, we're not through it yet. So we're all going to continue to move through these periods of shared adjustment. And we're also not out of it yet with, you know, um, disturbances in, in supply chain distribution. We got less physical distribution. We've got more competition online. So things are going to remain hairy for a while. What I've been really focused on is uh, brands and creating authentic connections. So building your audience in the ways that you can now. Um, maybe you're used to face-to-face -face or, or making your connections in a more um, physically direct way, but thinking about how you can uh, make those connections in, in new ways and uh, really build trust and add value for your, for your audiences. So a connection will continue to be a theme as we move through this. Uh, connection and authenticity for sure. Yeah, I know authenticity is, is kind of a bit of an overused term, but uh, but I think it's, it's it's more true these days is that um, uh, You know, there's just more communication going on in general. I mean, even with our neighbors, uh, we've been getting to know our neighbors more and that extends, you know, all the way through right away uh, having uh, talking to clients directly uh, and even phone calls and stuff rather than the, the, the emails that we used to do just to really get a sense for where people are at in their, in their process and how they're doing and, and, and how we can help. So well, we have uh, to keep doing that, like buyer behaviors and flux as we know, and it's not going back. And so, yeah. <laughs> so we have to, as business owners, stay connected uh, to, to where people are at as we're moving, as we're moving forward, because it, it you know, buyer behavior is going to continue to uh, stay in flux and change and, and move. And it, it's mm -hmm. not what we, we're used to so yeah it's uh, every day is a new day isn't it uh chris uh, how about you what are you seeing um you know i kind of mirror exactly what uh, what catherine was uh saying there as i as we kind of move from being local businesses to more global businesses in terms of coming online the competition gets a lot more fierce we need to be able to stand out and for me i think the big takeaway for going forward is need to be service uh you know people say well, you know, service, customer service, but I would like to take that to almost like the word servant. You know, we need to, to really take care of our customers now more than ever, just because people are really branching out to try to figure out how are we going to deal with things in this world. And it's those people, those businesses who take that kind of that servant mindset to help their customers to maybe build better relationships, build communities. Those are the ones that are kind of uh, going to strive after this, uh, you know, kind of the new normal comes back into play. So I, it's really important to be building those relationships, both new and old as well, right? So that's, I, I think getting into that is, is critical at this point. Indeed, and, and it's interesting that you use the term serve because uh, just looking at uh, for the session next week with Isabel uh, Mercier, the, the topic or the subject of her session is helpfulness is the new hustle how to rapidly grow your business impact and influence any economy by serving, not selling. So yeah. definitely that leaning towards serving and, you know, providing value, but I think more uh, serving, not selling. So uh, definitely the way things are going. All right. So that was a, a kind of all general question. So we're going to get into some of the specifics now. And like I said, we've broken them down, um, kind of categorized them by topic area. So uh, Catherine, we're going to, start with you again so get ready okay. um, the question is uh, always looking to improve my content marketing game what are you seeing uh, is working now and on the flip side what worked in the past that isn't effective now okay yeah the great question um, I think what's always worked is is providing value and uh ann hanley if you know her she's my content hero um, she says the best strategy is a story and what hasn't changed with COVID 19 is your purpose and your your what she calls your hero but your customer so audiences now want to know that you understand their problem and they want to like you <laughs> so those things are continuing and what we need to do now is deepening relationship with existing customers. So as we talked about that connection, um, showing long-term leadership. So how is your business and your brand lifting people up now in this time and as we just going forward? And uh, then something called meaningful relevancy. 
and and this doesn't need to be all serious and those are big words but you know what came out recently was uh Heinz with their puzzle have you seen that it's it's mm -hmm. I think it's brilliant it's uh they've created a puzzle it's all red pieces <laughs> it's <a> Heinz red <laughs> so to me that's an example it looks it looks disastrously hard I'm like ah look at that that thing's crazy evil but <laughs> I love that they took you know we're at home puzzling you know we're social distancing together they've woven in their their brand red they've created uh, a shareable campaign um, you have to say who you'd be doing the puzzle with you submit that it's being shared everywhere um, and so that is meaningful in fun and playful ways and it's relevant so thinking about uh, those types of things for your business um, as as far as what it isn't working now I, I would say that content's effective or not it really depends on the tone and the value against the existing backdrop of corona so if, if your content doesn't match or doesn't align with what's happening now or the the sentiment that people have the fears the concerns then that that content uh, or that marketing uh, activity is not uh, going to land now so it's situational Awesome. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is for Mark and it is, uh, how do we keep our brand strong in a time when our products and services are less consistent than we want them to be due to supply chain and labor disruptions? So that, that's a pretty interesting one because, uh, yeah, indeed, depending on the, why did Catherine get the easy one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to, let me just, let me just go into supply chain for a while. I, I, <laughs> Well, let's just, I mean, those are, uh, every business is, is uh, experiencing different challenges. So supply chain is one for sure, labor disruptions, uh, you know, clients, uh, you know, the, the economic hardship that uh, customers are, are facing. But uh, so the general question, how do we keep our, our brand strong in a time when products or services are, is, are less consistent and just what's happening now? I think the question behind the question is if, uh if you're used to delivering rubber boots in one day and suddenly you got to deliver them in a week, are people going to like you less, right? Is that kind of it? Sounds about right. I think so. Well, well um, I can, I can tell you that it, if to provide some context, the question came from, I think it's a, um, a food truck. Mm -hmm. So anything where there's food involved, but I think a food truck seems to be at this point would be a good business to be in because you're not a restaurant, you know, you're out, mm -hmm. but then of course they have the supply chain and labor uh, issues. So maybe if that so they, helps, they, they can't, they can't put pickles on the hamburger this week is what is what's coming out. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think there's a couple of things. One, you have to, uh, you have to have a sense of humor, which I think is vital in, in, in lousy times anyway. Uh, and, and I think a brand, you, with a brand, you can be a brand that's uh, very, very serious or playful or makes people sad, makes people angry. You know, there's a different, different type of, there's a different type of brands for different types of, of emotions. However, I think at a time like this, when people are in a crappy situation and they're going to a food truck, say, let's pull the food truck out. They're going to a food truck, they are in a state of mind. They have an expectation and that's one half of the brand. The brand is two things. One is a promise that you make and two, an expectation that people have. So you might want to dig into what expectations do they have of you? Now, it might be that they want the pickle on the burger and some people might be pissed off if they don't get the pickle. However, I would be willing to bet that people just want to get out and see other folks and remember what it used to be like to get good food. And they might not be too fussed. There's another thing that you can add to this. So they might not even be too stressed about the pickle. Or, you know, in the United States, Wendy's doesn't have uh, meat anymore because of the meat plants shutting down. So it's meatless at, Wen at Wendy's. That's a bit of a stretch for a brand to go all meatless, but hey, we could all afford to lose a few pounds and live a little healthier. So maybe you can make lemonade out of lemons. Where's the beef? Exactly. So that's just like <laughs> Thomas said, Thomas, you, you kick in here. Um, so I think a sense of humor could really, really help. And I also believe that communication above all, if you come right out and go, Hey guys, uh, if you haven't noticed, things are a little bit weird right now. 
and our pickles are being delayed. So we are now putting marshmallows in instead of pickles on our, on our hamburgers. You might want to try them. It's really weird, but we'll throw it out there. If you can show innovation, ingenuity, something new, something to give people a smile, they might forget that they're ticked off about no pickle. So I think that you, there's an ability to leverage elements of your brand. Hey, we're a food truck, so we're about a good time. We're about having fun. We're about having a laugh. Try to remember that and try to work your way past the, oh no, we don't have buns this week or we don't have pickles. And, and uh, you know, leverage the, the elements of your brand, the fun, the making people happy, a place to gather where there normally wasn't good food, a food truck, for example. Leverage that. Try to remember what people like about you. And you might be able to go past the little owies that we're all experiencing like that. We don't have pickles this week. Yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, there's some great points there. And I think just in general, uh, consumers and, and people uh, are a lot more accommodating and understanding right now. Um, you know, everyone knows the situation we're in. And, uh, you know, if you're missing a pickle or whatever it happens to be, you know, what's the big deal? If you can get food, you're, you're ahead of the game, right? So uh, communication, all that. But um, I, I kind of like what I'm seeing just in the way, in, in the limited interaction I've had with businesses so far. I haven't been out doing stuff that much. Um, but I'll just give one example. Actually, I wish they were on the call today, but uh, it's, uh, I think it's called Mod's Pizza over in Millstream, um, New Millstream, or uh, sorry, uh, Belmont Village there. Uh, ordered some pizzas a couple of weeks ago went in and picked them up, uh, brought the pizza home, got home and realized that it was actually missing one of the pizzas. The, uh, I think it was on the, the other shelf. And so they had missed it when they were giving it to me. And I didn't know. So, uh, but I went back and he knew because he, he, uh, had, had noticed that there was that pizza sitting there and he said, Oh, you're the guy. Sorry. I didn't give you the pizza. Uh, and he said, I'll just, uh, I'll whip up a, another one real quick. Uh, and uh, I said, ah, don't worry about it. I'll take this one. And he said, no, no, no. He said, take that one. You can keep it, you know, uh, eat it tomorrow, whatever, heat it up, but I'm going to make you a fresh one. And he gave me, so he gave me a fresh one for free and he gave me a coupon for another one for the next time we come back. So, you know, it's just being really understanding and accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, I want to touch on one more thing. Uh, sure. I just shared a story that everybody should click right now. Uh, it's a story by Gary, uh, Gray Miller, and it's, it talks about how to make customers a part of your small business story. And um, they took a disadvantage. They were at a farmer's market. They were selling jelly. Everybody else has fresh produce and tons of sniffy good stuff. They've got a whole bunch of jars of, of bright colored jelly. Uh, we don't even know what that stuff tastes like, you know? So what they did Somebody else mentioned, uh, um, get them to vote on stuff. It was somebody in the, in the chat, I believe. Uh, yeah, or, or a challenge, we have no pickles, but we offer three options and let's have a vote. That's exactly what Gray Miller writes about in this story. He said, what they did, they took a vote, they put up a whiteboard, just like Chris has behind him. Um, and, and they said, how do you use our jalapeno jelly? And they offered them four options and they had to dot the ones that they used the most. People went, they went batshit crazy. They loved it because they, suddenly they got involved in uh, inventing what this business should sell and what this business's product should be used for. People loved it. In fact, the, the guy recounts one story where a person actually said, no, you have to actually put in, um, I like the jalapeno jelly on a breakfast, all stuff, all grain uh, bagel. It, that wasn't one of the four categories, but he, he forced them to put it in. <laughs> but it's great. You get people involved in what you're doing, you know, would you like marshmallows, uh, an old sock or, or uh, you know, maybe some extra lettuce instead of the pickle, you know? So I think you can have a lot of fun with it. Options. The point right now, Mark, I, I think we're looking for some humor. I, it makes me think you know, if I get a hamburger, because there's no buns, I'm getting a hamburger <laughs> and one of your Lysol wipe sheets, I, yeah. I would be like, this is hilarious. I'm taking photos of it. Now I'm sharing it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, use your, use, your, use your imagination and, and make people smile. That's, that's what they want from you. They're not going to a food truck because they desperately need some food. They got food at home. Uh, they're going because they want to see other folks and hang out with other folks and, uh, and, and just get out of the damn house. So make it worth their while. Give them something to smile about. Indeed. Okay. Uh, 
Mr. W, we're going to get one for you here. And Already? this one actually uh, is, is three questions in one, I think. It covers three different areas. Uh, this person asks uh, or says uh, they're interested in WordPress and SEO DIY. So SEO being search engine optimization, DIY being do-it-yourself practices to complement sites and choosing uh, advertising via social media. So there you've got WordPress, SEO, and social media. So have at her. <laughs> All right. Well, just looking at that, it sounds more like a, a statement than a, than, than a question. So I'm going to kind of take this uh, in whatever direction I kind of want to go, I think. Um, so we're talking about WordPress, uh, SEO DIY practices, and choosing advertising via social media. Um, let's start at the advertising one first. Uh, one of the, the interesting parts about advertising on social media is um, everyone's kind of customers are in different places, right? Um, you know, you've got your, your moms and your crafters on Pinterest. Uh, you've got your business people on LinkedIn. Uh, I don't know who the heck hangs out on Twitter. That's kind of just a hodgepodge. But you really need to understand where your customers are first and foremost before kind of choosing any kind of advertising platform. From that point on inward, you need to know who your customer is, right? And that's where this comes into that whole customer avatar kind of situation. Um, the beauty about things like Facebook, for example, you can segment your customers in so many different ways that um, if you if you know your customer, you can kind of cater directly to them. Uh, and I think that's critically important instead of just kind of throwing this blanket advertising message out in the world. And that actually brings me back to the SEO DIY practices. It's the same type of philosophy is you need to know your customers. Uh, a lot of people think of uh, SEO is, uh, as a technical play, right? You know, I've got to have all these backlinks. I've got to have all these on-page SEO parts and pieces. That's not really the, the case anymore. I mean, if you're doing SEO for companies in super high competitive uh, niches, then yeah, you need to know that technical stuff. But if you're doing SEO from a DIY kind of level, you just need to know your customer. You need to know what they need. You need to be able to create content on your website that actually uh, is information that they need. And that's, I think that's, that's critical when it comes to, uh, to SEO. I like to think of it uh, this way. When someone fires up google.com or google.ca, they put their cursor on that little search box. At that moment, they're Google's customer. And it is Google's job to help their customer as best as they can. So if you're searching for food trucks in Victoria, BC, it's now Google's job to ensure that their customer finds the best food truck in Victoria, BC, right? Um, and so as a food truck owner, you've got a, a website, uh, you need to ensure and give Google this confidence that you're going to take care of their lead because this basically becomes a lead generation situation, right? Google wants you to take care of their lead. And if you can think of uh, from that perspective, SEO becomes a heck of a lot easier. It's not about backlink. It's not about how quickly your site moves. It's about can you serve Google's customer? Can you have Google's trust to take care of their customer? Because every, every query is a, is a problem that just needs to be solved. And Google is just looking for someone to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. The interesting part is we see in the search results, we see those fe featured snippets. A lot of the time, Google is just taking information from someone's website, plopping it into the search results because half the time, Google probably doesn't trust anybody to take care of the answer, but they're like, we found the answer. This is the best one. You're going to stay on our search engine because you're our customer and you're not going to click on anyone's website because they're not going to take care of you. So going back to service, going back to being a servant, that is how you do um, SEO. From a, from a WordPress standpoint, the major benefit of WordPress is there are a lot of tools that you can use to, to help you kind of tick these technical boxes if you want to kind of go that angle. I know a lot of people say that WordPress is like, it's the best thing for SEO. Um, it's like, yes and no. Out of the box, you know, maybe it is, but you know, you can still rank number one using Wix or, or Squarespace or any of the other kind of website builders out there. So yeah, WordPress has a lot of great tools that can help you. At the end of the day, it's service. That's really what it comes down to is taking care of Google customer. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and you reminded me just one, uh thing I wanted to add in there about uh, online advertising. And in this particular case, Facebook, it, it may apply to the other social networks as well. But uh, we at Be West, so Chris and I and, and our team do a lot of Facebook advertising. And what we found over the last month 
uh, is, is that the cost per click and the cost per lead has actually gone way down. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is that uh, we were on the, the phone with our Facebook rep yesterday and he was telling us that uh, Facebook page views uh, have gone up uh, 700%. So there's so many more people on Facebook right now. Uh, and so the number of page views, he actually gave me a really interesting uh, stat, the, uh, what they call the, uh, the scroll length. So how far you scroll, the average is 600 feet. Uh, I forget wow. what that was, if it was per week or per month, but meaning that it was like, uh, he said it was like the height of the, uh, the Empire State Building or something that people were scrolling on their phone on a, that, that couldn't be a day, must be a week. But anyway, the point is, is that um, there's more page views. And he said that they've lost a lot of their big advertisers, uh, like the, uh, the, the concerts, the events, the sporting events, uh, they're not advertising. So they've got more page views, fewer advertisers. So the cost has gone down. And we've certainly seen that with some of our clients where the, the exact same client that we were advertising with in January, right now their cost per lead is, is decreased almost uh, about 40%, I would say. Uh, so it's a good time to be advertising on Facebook if, if uh, you know, you're so inclined. Um, all right, I wanna throw another uh, question out for the panel. And this one uh, is a good one because I think it applies to probably all the people on the call uh, because I think for the most part, we're local businesses. Uh, and the question is, what is the best way to communicate that patronizing local business is the way to go moving forward after COVID-19? Um, and my personal opinion is that one of the many effects the pandemic is going to have on society in general and, and economies, and I think especially um, uh, Canadian economies, is that things are going to get more and more local. Uh, we're going to uh, want to use local and, and patronize local businesses um, because we, we truly do need to uh, support each other to make sure that we're all here, you know, tomorrow uh, so that we can uh, keep things moving. But uh, uh, whoever wants to jump in from the panel and um, uh, pontificate on that one, and I'll, I'll give you a little extra time to think about it uh, with um, a just added... Uh, uh, note that this session is being recorded, so uh, if you need to go back and, and relook at something uh, later, uh, we're going to post the recording on the Soho website, so you can look for that. So uh, again, what's the best way to communicate that patronizing local businesses is the way to go moving forward after COVID-19? Who wants that one? I can, uh, I can take a stab at it if, if it. anyone doesn't mind a mildly unpopular opinion, because that's, that's where I'm going with this one. Uh, the contrarian. Yeah. So uh, to, to explain this, um, I'll give a, an example of, you know, people say you got to support local business, got to support local business. Uh, I'm a nerd. So I uh, go to a local comic book shop to take care of um, purchasing any kind of nerdy supplies for a tabletop role playing game that I play. In this comic book shop, the book on average that I use costs about $75. You're a total nerd. <laughs> I can get that same book on Amazon for $25. So at that point, it really makes me think to myself, there needs to be some kind of direct benefit for me to spend an extra $50 to, to actually shop locally. Uh, you know, people say, oh, well, here's the, um, here's the benefit of shopping local is you're supporting local business, you're driving the local economy, and um, other businesses are able to stay alive. And I'm like, so how does that benefit me? And like, well, you support local businesses. And I'm like, that's an indirect benefit, right? That helps my local economy. But at the same time, directly, I'm now out $50. That takes money out of my family's pocket, my ability to put food on my family's table. So in that case, if this comic book shop said, yeah, you're paying $75 for this, but here is, you know, maybe uh, there's a points program. Maybe there is a, a special group that I can get involved with. You know, maybe there's like a secret handshake that I can learn. There needs to be an actual direct benefit to shopping local, not just the guilt that you're not shopping local. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Gen X kid through and through. So if you tell me that I have to shop local because I'm supposed to shop local, well, I'm going to probably do the opposite, right? So there needs to be some kind of benefit. People are selfish. They need, to, they need to have that benefit on their own. And that's kind of my opinion. We need to think every business is gonna be different in that capacity, but we need to, to find that benefit for our actual you know, customers and clients. I, I'm working on a project right now for a company out of um, California called Delivery. And I, the, the gentleman started as a sort of a serial entrepreneur in the tech space. 
And his deal is that um, as we see all this consolidation of companies and monopolization by companies like Amazon, things are getting a whole lot worse for local business because you just can't compete with Amazon as far as um, price goes, as far as, uh, you know, sort of all the, all the bells and whistles that Amazon offers. So he started a service or he's starting a service right now. It's in startup mode uh, called delivery. And essentially it is putting local businesses on an even um, uh, uh, field with these monsters like, you know, Walmart and Target and, 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 and Amazon, as far as, online service and delivery goes because small local businesses um, suffer because one, there's so many of them and it's hard to remember one website. And even if you do go to a website of a local downtown business, probably they won't be, they won't have the delivery terms that Amazon does. You know, they won't have the prices that Amazon does. So this guy's trying to put them all on a level playing field, sort of an aggregation and, and, a, and a fair market as opposed to a free market, which free market enables businesses to fall through the, the bottom of the, uh, of the, of the net as well. Um, but one thing that we went through totally reinforces what you just said. Uh, you need to remember there has to be a selfish benefit at the bottom of it. So if I want to buy from a local business, I have to be able to find a place that competes with Amazon where I can find all these local businesses, the equivalent of walking down a back street in Europe and finding all these cool little shops that I wouldn't find on the main street, which is Amazon. And I have to selfishly be able to order as easily as I would on Amazon. So, you know, I, I would pay a little bit more money, although there's a breaking point for, for loyalty, but you have to, if, you, if you're gonna charge more money as a local business, you have to offer something that um, the bigs like Amazon could, you know, that you could compete with them or something so unique and different that uh, the bigs just can't compete. So offering a selfish benefit first because people will say they shop because they're altruistic and, and they feel that they're investing in the social good, but at the base of it all, we're all selfish. Yeah. Well, I know um, my wife had uh, recently suggested that we, instead of going to Costco for our meat, because it's scary there, uh, that we order from Berryman Farms. And I said, okay, that's great. It's a local business. That's awesome. So she looked at it all up and she said, okay, it's going to be more expensive than going to Costco. And I was like, nope, not at all. Uh, but then my wife actually, you know, I went to the website and checked it all out and tried to figure out if there was a direct benefit to me. My wife came up with a direct benefit for me. She said, well, listen, we don't have to go to Costco. We're not going to risk, you know, being, you know, our social distancing. They're going to deliver it directly to our house and it is local meat and and she said, when you barbecue this, I guarantee you it's probably going to taste better. And she said, in the end, it's only going to cost us about 40 more dollars than usual. And you're going to taste that difference. And I said, okay, let's do it. And so I think that's just, people just need to really explain that benefit, where that extra money goes and why you, you know, you need it. So, yeah. Let me build on that just for a second too. Okay. Um, there's intangibles that people often don't account for. They say, well, we cost more. We can't, we can't compete or we're only, we don't have a great online presence, but there's a whole bunch of intangibles. You talked about the comic shop. There's a whole bunch of intangible differences. If I go to a local butcher and I get an expertise, Amazon has reviews, great, that's nice. But if I get real, real good expertise or weird and quirky expertise, suddenly the playing field starts to even up again. Well, there's, uh, there's lots there, and uh, I, I just have one comment to throw in uh, on uh, what Chris was talking about. Uh, you, you mentioned some influencer marketing there, which was uh, your wife as the influencer. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> that will also have a, a major impact on yeah. uh, where the family does the shopping. Uh, Catherine, did you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I, I agree with both Mark and Chris. I mean, well, you know, what I was going to say was really going to support that in that I would rather or see spending less time on, you know, pounding uh, patronized local businesses drum uh, and, and more time on the compelling reasons to choose those businesses, highlight the businesses, the interesting things that they're doing, uh, the ancillary benefits that um, Mark and Chris talked about, um, you know, I'm not out buying nerd supplies, but I'm a, <laughs> or, or only for my own special nerdy. But, uh, you know, I, I think so many people, the people who are already believe in supporting small business, small businesses, 
you don't need to talk to them more about that message, but show them what's out there and, um, and pique their interest and, and get them supporting that way. And then also look for the channels where um, you can make connections about small business and tell those stories. And maybe there's some ways to expand where the story is being told. And in doing so, you then do beat the drum for choosing small business, but you're giving compelling reasons to do so. Mm -hmm. Well, I, th I think I could see you nerding out on bike supplies, Catherine. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's change gears a little bit and move on to another question. This one I, I kind of put in my category, so I'll answer it first, but I'll, I'll open it up and see what others have to say. Uh, and the question is, how can you run an interactive seminar with 10 attendees that completely emulates a standard business seminar, for example, Zoom or Skype? So uh, I'm not sure what a, a standard business seminar is, but I'm assuming it's kind of like a, an in-room workshop seminar where you've got uh, you know, a, a presenter or a workshop leader and 10 people, and you might spend a day going through some materials, some interactive uh, sessions, presentation, uh, you might have a workbook and so on. So uh, certainly that can and is being done online um, with the, uh, I guess, limitations that you have of being online, being that you're not in person. Um, but, you know, so you don't have that kind of tactile interaction, but you still have, uh, with, with video and audio anyway, you still have all the, the facial expressions and, and the um, body language and, uh, and real-time interaction. So it is, and, and just as we're doing today and, and we've done uh, before, uh, it's not that hard to do. So I'm not sure if the question is more of a technical nature around the functionality. So they mentioned Zoom or Skype. So today we're on Zoom. Uh, I have uh, tested a few other platforms that we've used previous to this. We used uh, GoToMeeting and um, Webinar Jam, uh, And we've got a couple of others coming up that we're going to be testing. So they all, they're different kind of flavors of the same thing. Um, and it really it sort of depends on what you need for your business because some of them have really slick um, kind of communications and marketing applications uh, embedded or built in. So um, automated email streams for follow up and so on, uh, polling, uh, all kinds of good stuff. So, so far I've found Webinar Jam is probably as far as the complete package, Webinar Jam has been the best so far and we may end up going back to that. Uh, but there's a few others that I'm going to be testing coming up because uh, in addition to or outside of just these um, weekly webinars, uh, we're going to do uh, Soho Summit as a complete uh, virtual conference, so an online conference. And there's another uh, level of platforms that enable that interaction where you've got a speaker and then maybe you've got breakout rooms where you can actually do separate individual workshops, uh, and there's lots of other built-in interactivity. There's polls, there's questions, there's lots of different things you can do, and there's kind of a networking function built in as well. So if the person who asked that, what other webinar platforms are you going? Uh, there's one called Virtual Summit uh, that I'm gonna try. Uh, and uh, the other is uh, WebEx uh, by a company called Citrix. They're, they're a huge one. Um, oh. Oh, uh, and, and actually, I just tried Microsoft Teams the other day. I, I was on the receiving end of that. So somebody uh, who I had a session with, uh, and, I, and I wasn't super uh, impressed with that. Um, but yeah, those are the ones I'm testing. Uh, so uh, I'll open it up and see if anyone else has uh, some thoughts. And, and I'll also throw out um, something we were talking about earlier, uh, is that uh, people may be finding that there's a bit of webinar fatigue happening right now, just because of the the amount and volume of these kind of like what we're doing free webinars happening. So there's so much to choose from. It's funny. There's actually another one that's happening right now that I wanted to attend. Of course I couldn't because I'm hosting this one, but it's being recorded. So I'll, I'll listen to it later, but there's just so much going on that I'm sure there's webinar fatigue because people want to just, they have work they have to do, or they're just kind of tired of, of sitting looking at uh, some talking heads. So Anyway, I'll throw that open to the, the three of you and see if you have anything to add. Can I just throw in one thing real quick? I, sure. I, I wonder, we're all trying to replicate live meetings or seminars uh, using a digital platform. And I think that's great. And I think it's getting better. Um, however, I, I wonder if we're all, you, know, you remember when, or still happens, 
when uh, veg food came out and guys like Eve's, they said, we've got veg hot dogs and veg hamburgers. And you're going, why don't you just make good veg, veg stuff that hamburgers and hot dogs aren't? Why are you trying to imitate what's already being done really well? And, you know, I, I know they're a huge success, and, but I just want to use it as an example. I wonder if now is the time to look at other media uh, for doing information sharing like this. Maybe there's stuff that folks are ignoring. Maybe by trying to replicate something that works really, really well in a boardroom by just making it digital, maybe we're missing the real opportunity to try something different. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, audio podcasts or I don't know what. I don't have the answer. I just have, it just struck me that maybe it's a question we should be asking. Are we trying to mimic something that works really well digitally? And can we do a good job of it? You can do podcasts by audio. Audio podcasts. It's true. I, 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 sometimes I, I just, I get my messages out with a passenger pigeon, right? I tie yeah. things to their legs and send them out. Yeah. Podcasts well, I, no, I, are the, uh, sorry, po I can say podcasts are the, um, the, the veg version of the, the, the video casting, right? Yeah. Totally. <laughs> um, no, just to pick up on your point, Mark, uh, I, I totally agree that uh, a lot of what's happening right now, I mean, we're, we're in a whole uh, version of flux right now. And, we don't know what even tomorrow is going to bring or what's going to come out of it, but I'm absolutely positive that a lot of this change that's happening is going to be for the better. And we're going to have these aha moments like, wow, why weren't we doing that a year ago? This is great. This is so much more efficient and so much more productive. Um, and and uh, I, I mean, I did notice one thing and there's probably many stories like this already, but some of the big banks, I think RBC and BMO and so on, because everyone's working from home now, they've had to close a bunch of branches and they've only got one branch in every certain area that's open for people to go into, uh, they've already said, wow, we had no idea that we could actually still do business uh, with so fewer branch branches. So, I mean, it's going to be a bad thing for, for some folks because they, they may end up losing their jobs, but a lot of branches are going to close and you're going to be seeing a lot more online banking with maybe just one big branch where people can go in. But uh, I think that's going to be true for a lot of businesses is they're going to realize that hey, this working from home thing is actually pretty good and people are productive and maybe they're getting even more done and they're happier. Uh, so yeah, do we need all this office space? Probably not. Do we need all these parking spots for employees? Probably not. So a lot, a lot of good will come out of it, I'm sure. Uh, did uh, anyone else have anything to add about that? Uh, we kind of went off on a tangent there. It was about doing uh, seminars by Zoom, but uh, just the, the general kind of technology changes and adjustments that we're making. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me throw another one over to, uh, to Catherine. This is a, another writing related one. So somebody said that they had written a book targeted to business owners. And uh, could you share a few thoughts on how to best leverage that content? So if they've got a book, obviously they've got tons of content. So, uh, and uh, certainly Mark, actually, you could probably <laughs> pipe up on this one too, because you've written a couple of books, but uh, yeah, Catherine, any thoughts on that? How to leverage? Yeah, I'll, absolutely. I'll say a few things and then, yeah, Mark, please jump in. Um, so first, congrats on writing a book. That's, uh, yeah. that's awesome. And the great news is the book is your pillar. So that's your, your main piece of content. And now you can get really creative with the micro content. And, you know, by pillar, think of it as a turkey dinner. You cook the turkey, and so uh, now the micro content is your stuffing, your potatoes, your carrots, and your gravy. So you're going to figure out how to use all the accompaniments uh, in a way that uh, that you can share your um, book. So a couple thoughts there: get targeted. So what kind of business owners specifically? Is it small, medium, etc.? So figure out who your target is and answer the questions, what keeps them up at night, which I'm sure that you've done in the book. So that's part of what you can start sharing. Uh, go where the business owners are, um, provide value, um, be part of and spark conversations um, where the business uh, owners are, and then have a look at what your uh, competitors are doing in the space. There's nothing wrong with emulating and learning and seeing what they're doing and applying it to the, the strategy that you're going to create. And then look as well at uh, ways that you can share your information about the book, uh, a live virtual reading, answering questions, doing webinars. I know we said that there's fatigue, but I feel that if people are interested in a topic, 
then they're going to join your webinar. And if you've got one person, five, it doesn't matter on the count. You've got interested people, you've got an audience. Um, and uh, so that those are some ideas. But Mark, you have books and have shared that content. So maybe over to you. Yeah, I'm absolute garbage at promoting my content. <laughs> Uh, my only advice would be uh, to get smart people who are not you to promote your content for you. Um, I have, uh, I, I had Chris and Chris uh, go under the hood of my website and they discovered that it was just a horrible leaky bucket of, of wasted opportunity and, you know, you know, misshapen notions. And then they said, you know, you got these books. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. And, and they said, how are you making money off of them? I'm going, I'm not. I don't like making money because I'm a not-for-profit. Um, and so they said, how about we make some money off of books? And how about we promote the books? And I said, I've tried all this before and I'm absolute garbage at it. And I think it has a lot to do with trying to understand what people want by looking at it from your perspective. Your book's your baby. And so you, you assume what people want from the book. But I have Chris and Chris look at my book and they go, we should do this and this and this and this and this and this and this. Never thought of any of that, even though it's exactly the same advice I give my clients. So go figure. Um, it's an Achilles heel. You can't spot it in yourself. I yeah. highly recommend finding some people who are really good at sharing content like Chris and Chris and getting it out to the right people and packaging it in a way and dripping it to people in a way that they get real excited and energized and the book is the prize at the end of the, at the, end of the trail. Um, but they've, they've gone well above that too and they've built a course around it and all kinds of stuff. So it's, it's super exciting. I would have thought of none of it if I was left to my own devices. Well, thanks very much for that. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris. Uh, uh, thanks very much for that plug. It was totally unplanned and unattended for it to lead there. <laughs> but I, I did want to say, actually, it's so interesting. I was looking over on my bookshelf to see if it was, it was here. It must be on my other bookshelf. But your first, I think it was your first book, Didn't See It Coming, that I read probably at least five years ago, if not more, which was awesome. But it just occurred to me that isn't that so apropos for the current time we find ourselves in Didn't See It Coming? So oh, yeah, if any, yeah, yeah, yeah. If anyone uh, on the another call thing I didn't get, think of <laughs> wants to get a copy, uh, go go to markstoiber.com and pick up a copy of that. But uh, it is yeah, perfectly uh, apropos for uh, what's happening today. Uh, sorry, Chris, I, I cut you off there. What were you going to say? You know, I, that totally disappeared. But actually, um, it led me to another thought that kind of more related to the question about kind of getting that content uh, out there in regards to uh, to Mark's book, because uh, you actually lent me a copy of Mark's book. Um, maybe that's where ago. it is. <laughs> no, no, no. I, so, and I gave it back to you because I read like the first couple of chapters and I'm like, I'm like, I have zero interest in this. Sorry, Mark. I went through it. I was like, I'm just not interested in this. And then I met Mark, you know, we went to, you know, did some events together and I ended up getting, I don't know how it happened. I ended up getting a copy of Mark's book and he's like, oh, let me sign it for you. And he, you know, he signed it and gave it off to me. And I'm like, well, then I read, and I read it afterwards and I'm like, well, actually I enjoy this now because I know Mark a little bit better. I understand this. I understand his personality. So I think in terms of like promoting a book or your content, people need to know who you are as well. They need to, you need to have that, again, that, that, that community and have your personality shine because your content really just on its own might not be that exciting. But if there's context to your content or a, again, a story behind it, a background, it suddenly gives it brand new life. And that's like exactly what happened with, uh, with me and Mark's book as well. Yeah. And now I can't, I can't find my copy of the book either. So I think. All right. Mark, all right. All right. I'm going to give up. away three copies of my book. First three people who mm. write stuff down. Uh, I'm going to give away three copies. Chris wrote down the website where you can get it, but I'll, I'll give you an unsigned copy, which is a lot more rare. Um, <laughs> and I'll, for the first three, for the first three people, I'll give you, give you, I'll send a, uh, and I, I need your addresses and all that stuff to send the book. All right, there it is. Wow, we're we're uh, giving stuff away. Oh, we're giving stuff away. <laughs> and I'll 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 and a car for you. And a car sanitizer. for you. <laughs> awesome. Well, uh, it is eleven fifty four, so uh, we're about five minutes away from um, the end of the session. So uh, at the end of the session, we're as I said, we're going to pick do a random draw and pick a winner uh, for the one hour brainstorming session. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted again open it up to the floor and just see. Uh, if there's any kind of closing comments or, or thoughts that you wanted to share. Uh, and at the same time, um, 
ask people who are on the call to use the chat function uh, in case you do have any follow-up questions uh, to the original question that you asked or, or any other questions that you would like us to address. So, um, but uh, as we're waiting for those to come in, uh, any closing thoughts or uh, things that you, you plan on doing uh, moving forward? Closing thoughts. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for uh, snarky comments from the chat line to, to tell us, <laughs> give us something to respond to. Doesn't anybody have anything snarky to say? Uh, no? I think we, we we cleared that out already. All snark. I think we cleared that out pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, in that case, uh, I will. Black swans for breakfast. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming on the call to um, participate today and submitting your questions. I, I really want to thank uh, the three panelists, uh, Chris Whiteley, Catherine Hamilton, and Mark Stoiber. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing your time with us today. Uh, all of your information is on the Soho Summit website as well. So if people want to connect with uh, either of the three of them, you can do so uh, from SohoSummit.com, uh, get in touch with them. And uh, at this point, so we're going to do a random draw. So I, I've got everyone in an Excel spreadsheet and uh, I'm using the uh, randomizer in Excel. So you spin the wheel, click a button, and then it's going to tell me which number, which cell. And it is Kristen Yarker. Kristen, are you still on the call? There she is. Congratulations, Kristen. So uh, you are the lucky winner of a one hour uh, brainstorming session with the four of us. So uh, I will follow up with you by uh, email afterwards. Uh, hey, yeah, congratulations. Uh, I'll follow up with you by email just to uh, arrange uh, a good time for the uh, five of us, I guess, to get together via Zoom. Uh, and uh, we'll send you that um, uh, the needs assessment document. And it looks like you were one of the people that responded uh, for Mark's book as well. So you're going to get a copy of the book too. I, uh, I, just, uh, I just sent uh, an email to Jordan and um, uh, mm -hmm. Kristen and uh, Shirley. Um, folks, if, uh, send me, uh, send me your, your mailing address so I can pop a copy of the book in the mail for you. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Uh, have a wonderful Thursday. And uh, don't forget to watch for the recording of this coming out. And then also next week, we've got Isabel Mercier, two weeks from today, uh, Hugh Culver. Uh, and with that, I'll say uh, over and out. Uh, see you next week. Have a great day. Thank right. you. Thanks, Later, everybody. Everyone.